The Indianapolis Zoo is one of the top drank zoos in the nation. It attracts attention from all over with its exhibits and exotic animals. Kenna Ross, Ellie Frecker, and myself, Abby Hogan, all had one question about the zoo. Is the Indianapolis Zoo as good as we all think it is? We were able to get in touch with Head of Public Relations, Judy Palermo, and she was able to set us up with some interviews. One of the people we were able to interview was Sally Zalanis, Head of Animal Directory. Two other people we were able to interview were Abby Dome and Lisa Olin, Zoo Animal Trainers. We were given the opportunity to walk around to all of the exhibits while taking pictures, reading information cards, and looking closer at each animal and its habitat. We got a lot of information about not only the animals, but the zoo as a whole. We were able to really see what the Indy Zoo is really like. I'm Ellie Frecker and I'm asking questions about the animal process, referring to my primary sources which are Sally Zalonez, PETA.com, ICAnimal.com. My first question is, is how does the zoo get animals? Places like a lot of our sea lions or we have animals that can't be released back into the wild. Um, I get our fish from other facilities where there are surplus animals and I can also get them, depending on what they are, from places who raise them, they're captive bred or aquaculture. So that's usually where I get animals from. Uh, why I get them, we have a collection plan for each exhibit. There is a plan of what to put in each tank and I go by that collection. My next question is, is what does an animal have to go through before being in an exhibit? Um, we work, our, our vets contact any other facility who may be giving us animals to ask about any health needs or requirements. Once an animal first comes to the zoo, it's quarantined for 30 days at least, so we can uh, make sure it's healthy and it doesn't bring in any parasites or diseases to the collection. My next question is, is how often do you bring animals in? That really depends on each section of the zoo. Um, I think the encounters in deserts and oceans might bring in animals more than, say, the plains area or green mammals or tigers. So it really depends on which area of the zoo and which species. My last question is, is where do the animals come from? Uh, they mostly come from other zoos. If they're wild, they like two of our sea lions, the young sea lions, probably enjoy. Um, they were stranded when they were younger and they couldn't be released into the wild. And then do the animals here go to other zoos? A lot of times we do exchange animals with other facilities as part of breeding programs or just, you know, we have an animal who might need different care or a different environment. So we will put it up for surplus for other ACA facilities. I'm Kenna Ross and I interviewed two of my primary sources, zoo animal trainers, Abby Dome and Lisa Oland. I asked them questions about the animal care and how it is like to be an animal trainer. Also, according to AZA.com, the Indianapolis Zoo is AZA accredited and I'm here to see what regulations they have to follow. My first question is, what type of personality do you have to have to be an animal trainer? Well, I think you have to be definitely passionate. It has to be something that you are, it's not just a job, it's your whole lifestyle, that our lives are just as devoted to our family as our families are. My next question is, what made you want to be a zoo animal trainer? Ever since I was little, um, I've always loved animals and the ocean, and uh, I grew up in the Midwest, so it was always something Uh, 
uh, primates first, and then I started to work with polar bears and they said they're heading out now. about marine animals, and then it just kind of went from there. But it's always something that I've done. Um, I've always loved animals, and I was pre-vet when I was at IU, and then when I was graduating, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do, um, so I applied for an internship here in Indianapolis Zoo, and luckily I was chosen as an intern in the marine mammal department, probably from the very first day. My next question is, what is it like to be a zoo animal trainer? Except that your schedule is going to be weird, that you'll be here on Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's, any, any holiday. Um, our job is to take the best possible care of all the animals here, so you um, definitely have to be, have to be flexible. Um, you have to be very hard working. There's a lot of the behind the scenes stuff that people don't see. It is a lot of hard work, uh, a lot of teamwork with one another. You've got to be able to communicate and be able to make dirty work, fun, um, you have to be able to adapt because you change constantly with the animals and with the people that you work with, um, but you have to be good to the public because not only do you just work with the animals, but we do all the presentations, we do all the behind the scenes, um, tours for different people, so you need to be able to also communicate with people just as well as you're going to be communicating with the animals. My next question is, what is a typical day for a zoo animal trainer? Between 7 and 8 a.m. Um, first thing we're going to be doing is getting their fish ready. So we thaw like, about 200 pounds or more of a fish every day, more than that, every day, um, making sure that there's no rips, no tears, everything's perfect. It's a good quality fish for humans, the same as things animals. Um, and we're preparing all their diets. So we take care of the dolphins, the seals, the sea lions, the roars, the polar bear, um, making sure that they've all got their food ready and then we're going out and cleaning. And I'm making sure that we're cleaning up any of their messes from the night before, or our messes from the night before, and they have a nice clean home um, to, to live in. And then generally, we're right open at 9 a.m. and we're ready to interact with the public and like do a dolphin presentation, maybe a sea lion chat, um, working one-on-one -on -one with the public and teaching them about the animals and how they can help protect them. And then it goes back and forth between making the food, talking to the public, cleaning, and then it's going to cycle all over and over again until about 5 p.m. as long as it's good. So we make sure we give them their enrichment, their playtime for the day, um, more cleaning, and we fill out a lot of records. So anytime we're interacting with the animals, there's a record of it somewhere. We're writing down what they did, what we did, what they ate, what they played with, anything. She pretty much covered it. Uh, I mean, we work really hard, and we work hard to take care of the animals and making sure that we are educating the public, you know, about the animals, about conservation, because that's why the animals are here. They're not just here for fun. They serve a purpose, a very important purpose, to represent all the animals that are out in the wild. My next question is, do you ever feel nervous around the animals? Well, there's always different situations where when you're, when you're new to an experience, you should have a little bit, not necessarily discomfort, but um, have a little bit of cautious with them because they're not pets, um, they're wild animals, and uh, we have a lot of protocols and safety training in place, and we're always communicating with one another to make sure um, everything we're doing is within our procedures and safe, um, but yeah, I think you always have a little bit of... The wild animals are unpredictable, so you always have to be ready. I mean, we work with very large animals. Even a dolphin in the water is like 550 pounds. And when you're in their environment, you know, you're like the littlest, littlest animal. Uh, so, you know, they could if they want to. They could easily hurt you. So you have to really do their behavior. That's why we with them all the time. That we can pretty much guess how they're going to react, although you're not always going to know. Um, we also work a lot of high risk areas. We work with polar bears, we work with tigers, and those are high risk areas where you can't show mistakes. There are lots of locks, there's lots of procedures, there's a lot of protocols, and you follow them to keep yourself safe, to keep your other animals safe, and keep the public safe. My next question is What do you not like about your job? Hmm. I mean, we love our jobs. Yeah. We love our jobs. I mean, I've done it for over 20 years. 
But I mean, sure, there's times where I don't want to come in and work on Christmas. I'd rather be with my family. I mean, you know, those are just, that's just life, you know. But we know, we know what the rules are going in. We know what our life is going to be like and stuff like that. So we know that if there's a problem with your 24 hours a day, um, you know, holidays we're going to be here, weekends we're here, you know, we know that ahead of time. Well, sometimes you would prefer not to be, but, um, but I think, yeah, we Love our job and we think very much what we do. Not a lot of people. I mean, in Indiana, you want to work with a lot of great animals like dolphins. There's only one facility in the whole state. You know, there's only like 30 some, I think, in the whole United States with walrus. There's only a handful of facilities in the whole United States that have walrus. So we are very, very lucky to get to work with the animals that we do. My next question is, what type of education is needed to become certified to be an animal trainer? Nowadays, it tends to be a, a bachelor's degree. Um, I think most students like to have a science background. And so um, all of us, we, we have a, a range of degrees that we've achieved. So ranging from psychology, to zoology, biology. Uh, we have an education trained person. We even have someone who went to school for engineering. Uh, later in her career decided that the passion that she had lied with animals and so she rerouted and came here. And, um, but uh, we all have that science background and then in addition to not just school, there's a lot of hands-on training that uh, we've all achieved. Working at other facilities, things with maybe exotic animals, maybe dogs and cats, the Humane Society, a vet clinic, um, and then marine animals, we're all scuba certified. My next question is, what is a typical day for a zoo animal? Well, I mean, it just depends, you know. It depends on what animal it is. Like right now, you know, the dolphins, they're all together, they're swimming, they're doing dolphin things. Be in dolphins, doing their thing, and then they wait for us to come out, feed them, and then also we play with them and things like that. Um, they watch every little thing we do. They're very nosy. They're like, you know, every single thing that's going on. They, they watch us, they watch the public. Um, but most of the time, they're just doing their own thing. They've got their own social order, and they're just being dolphins. And then it's kind of like, you know, the, uh, we ask them to you know, Presentations throughout the day, and they have their choice whether they're going to participate or not. Um, usually they do, but they sometimes choose not to, and that's okay. We don't make them do anything, we just try to be in the course when they do to increase the chances that they'll want to do it. Um, we play with them throughout different times, move around. And although we have pretty typical schedules as keepers, I uh, think one thing that we always really strive for is that the animals don't have too solid of a are really good about falling into a pattern in a routine. Um, and for an animal, that might not be the most positive thing to do. So we try to add little variations, positive variations to their days where we can and not. Although their feet may be at the same same time every day, we do different things, we can add more to we can do all kinds of stuff. And that's where we all work together to make sure that they're getting the most of their day. We mix up what trainers work with them, we play with them, we mix up what we do, what toys they do, what trainers are out there. Trying to make everything a little bit different for them and more interesting for them every day. My next question is Do you ever feel close or attached to the animals? Most of our animals are, are free contact in the marine mammal department, with the exception of the high risk animals like the polar bear, uh, the brown bears, the tiger. Um, so we um, were lucky enough to work you know, right up with them, so that's where that bond comes into play. That build that trust with them. It's not just with food, it's it. we incorporate other things. Like those play sessions are important because they're fun, but it helps them build that trust and bond with us. Um, How would they know what to Way out there, specific diets each animal has some specific formulated diet, how much they get, how much they get wind, and their vitamins, things like that. Um, and we use our training sessions to give them their food. So they may get a total amount for the day, but say at the 8 o'clock session, they're going to get a third of that diet, and they get a fifth of that diet the next day, and we just give it to them. The, the 
protected Prenzac animals, we can have creative ways to get them their food. We can put it on their exhibit and then let them out to do it. Or we can do training sessions with them and we either toss their food over a barrier or we have specialized food shoots that we can give them. Well, we also have feed sticks that we put like tigers, uh, you know, like a meatball on the feed stick and you put it ways depending on where you're training them and what you're training them. So uh, use a feed stick, we use a feed shoe, but um, we're very careful obviously that uh, we don't put any old feed or anything in the My next question is, do the animals ever feel trapped? I think, um, I don't know, that's an interesting wording of it, just, yeah. because, um, just because an animal is in the wild doesn't necessarily mean that um, that's a, a bad thing for them. So our goals are more towards um, making sure they are exhibiting natural behavior because that's a sign of a, a healthy, happy animal. Give them the opportunity to, to do those natural behaviors. Um, but um, I mean, this is their home and you know, we just incorporate that into their day. And for their health, I mean, their exhibits, like if you look at the sea lion exhibit, it is designed for sea lions where they would haul out uh, different caves they could go in sun themselves, the water temperatures and all the pools are kept at levels that are appropriate for those animals. So the walrus are kept in water that's 50 degrees, whereas the sea lions are in water that's like 65 degrees, dolphins are at 80. It just depends on an animal that we do replicate that. When we take care of penguins, their life cycle is the same as what they would have in the wild. So while they're not in the wild, uh, we do replicate a lot of different facets of their life um, that is good for them health-wise. And then, like she was saying, we try to make sure, even though they're not in the wild, that they're exhibiting natural behaviors, which is a sign of a healthy, happy family. So, what kind of medical care do the animals get? They get a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, that's probably the most important, well, some of the most important behaviors that we train. So, um, you know, most people will see the big jumps and the flips, and those are the attention grabbing behaviors that the public wants to see. Um, but using the same techniques, we can train um, a dolphin to allow voluntary blood sample. So, just like with you, it can be uncomfortable, but again, that's where that trust comes into play. And a little bit of fish, we train them by using baby steps. It's okay, we're going to do this, and we have lots of fish in the belly rub, it's going to really make it fun. Um, doing things like administering eye drops, animals like pinnipeds, like seals, and sea lions, and walrus are really susceptible to the eye issues. So, it's vital that we have a way to give them that medication in a way that's uh, you know, low stress. If you can't also restrain them every time you, know, you need an eye drop, um, because they're getting three at a session three times a day. Um, so we train all kinds of behaviors that the vets may come up with, or they may come up with a technique like, hey, it'd be really great if we could collect an EKG on the ceiling. Okay, great. We'll talk to other places. My next question is, what type of health care do the animals get? Tigers, um, even though we don't work with them hands on, like you know, free contact, we do protected contact. So we have like where we open a gate and they bring their tail out to us and we move their tail and we actually draw blood into their tail. So that way they're able to get their vaccines and we're able to draw blood and things like that without having to put them under anesthesia. It's a win win because it's less stressful for us, it's less stressful for the animals. We get everything done. That we so training is really, really important, and those health behaviors are important because animals mask illness, and they usually will mask illness until they're very, very ill and can't mask it anymore. And so for that reason, we need to be taking opportunistic opportunities to check their blood samples. If they even seem the least bit off, that we need to be checking different things and making sure they're okay. And that's why we're working with them every day. It's kind of like, you know, parents with their children. They might say, mm, something just doesn't seem right. I can't tell you exactly what it is, but I know that something's just not right for this animal today. And we'll keep a really close eye on them, and that may be when we take a blood sample, let's see what their blood's doing. It may all come back just fine. Maybe they were just having an off day. But that's why us working with them hands-on every day is important. So we do know what seems normal and abnormal for that animal, and if need be, we can take the necessary uh, health measures. 
My next question is, are the animals always in their exhibits? It depends. A lot of our animals, the sea lions, are always on the exhibit. Their water is kept at a constant temperature year-round, so in the wintertime it feels warm, and in the summertime it feels cool. So they stay on exhibit all, all the time. Walrus stay on exhibit all the time. Obviously, dolphins are in the building, so it can be temperature controlled for them because they could not withstand and do the animal. Um, tigers go out. Most of our animals can go out because they are cooler weather animals, but you know, in the plains area, a lot of those animals And my last question is, what type of training do the animals get? Um, well, that's uh, where the training sessions come into play. So those, again, those jumps and flips, they look like a lot of fun, but they're, they're also very important for their health. So um, again, we'll look at their natural behaviors, and we'll see if you know, the dolphins may do a jump on their own. I mean, they can get really cool, and then we'll find a way to train it and put it on a hand too. Um, but that gives them an opportunity to get their body moving. My name is Abby Hogan and I conducted an interview with Head of Public Relations at the Indianapolis Zoo, Judy Palermo, via email because she was unavailable the day we went in for interviews. I asked questions based off of my primary sources and also off of our own curiosity. I first asked what are other zoos like compared to the Indianapolis Zoo? In summary of what Judy said, she spoke of how all AZA accredited zoos and aquariums all strive to educate and take good care of animals that are in the zoo or even in the wild. She also spoke of how it really depended on where the zoo was. As my second question, I asked why do so many people love coming to the zoo? She said there are many reasons why people love coming here. We are a family destination. Families can come and make memories, spend time together, and get up close to a beautiful animal they would usually only get to see in a book, on TV, or online. My third question was, is it still an educational experience if we don't read the info cards? She responded saying that we still get an educational experience if we don't read the cards because there are keepers and naturalists that will come out and interact and have conversations with us. One of my questions was, are zoos necessary slash important in today's society? Judy responded saying that yes, they are still necessary because numbers of poaching has gone up so much that zoos have turned into conservation in habitats for the animals that are endangered. Another one of my questions was, is the zoo hiding anything from us? She said that they try and be as transparent as possible with everything. They take great care of their animals and that they try and be open with that care. I also asked, what is your personal opinion on zoos and how they work? She says she feels blessed to work there and she loves getting to see the guests learning every day. She also says that zoos make a huge difference in helping raise awareness for wildlife. I asked, besides being AZA accredited, what makes this zoo so special? According to my primary source, it has a lot of regulations to be AZA accredited, but what really made the zoo special was the workers and all the dedication that they put into working there. 
My final question was, is the Indianapolis Zoo doing things right? She says that they know that they are doing things right, but to make sure, they constantly evaluate animal and guest safety. They also make sure that their workers are in safe conditions as well. Out of all the research that we did, and out of all the interviews that we conducted, we did find the answer to our question. And yes, the Indianapolis Zoo is as good as we all think it is.